Well, from the from the very tiny in fossils to something alarmingly large. Um, so uh, <laughs> I don't normally stray into this discipline in geology. I, I, there isn't a continental collision in sight in this evening's talk. Um, but uh, uh, an old friend and colleague of mine, Jim Buckman, who uh, works at the Petroleum Institute at Harriet Watt University, and, and I through the Countryside Ranger Service in, in, in Lynn Park here, um, kind of independently um, found this set of footprints on the sandstone bedding surface in a place that's literally almost on my front door where I, where I live on the south side of Glasgow. And this is the famous bridge over the white cart in, in Lynn Park, one of the oldest cast iron bridges in the world um, on, on the river there. And uh, just up river upstream under the bridge and around the corner from there. I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is. I want to keep it a bit of a secret, really, um, partly because uh, I'm sure you won't, but I don't want anybody going in there with an angle grinder trying to chop, chop it out like happened with some other ones. But um, if you come and buy me enough whiskey, I'll tell you. Uh, so if we can just move on from there. Uh, this alarmingly nasty coloured um, geological map from which I've lifted from the BGS uh, map viewer um, has the, um, uh, the the pattern of geology in the in the, the Western Midland Valley, um, and you can see the sort of reds and purples and pinks forming the volcanic uh, um, plateau volcanics uh, of the early Carboniferous, forming that kind of horseshoe-shaped mass, uh, uh, enclosing within it the sedimentary succession that's younger than that in the in the Glasgow Basin there. Um, and we're just going to home in, you see these uh, green coloured units, which are sills, the two sill complexes, um, and one of them uh, produces a famous waterfall, so could I just advance the slide there, please, yeah, just in there, so we're going to zoom in on that next one, um, right in on there, so, so those light green things, that, that's the Cathcart sill, um, and in one of those, uh, again, if we could have the next slide, just inside that yellow oval there, where it takes a little bit of a kink, um, that's where the white cart goes over the sill, and that's the Lynn uh, of, of Lynn Park. And it's uh, it. The rocks in the cliff face here um, are, are typical of the limestone coal formation in the Clack Mountain group in Lynn Park and uh, more generally in the Midland Valley of Scotland. Um, we can see uh, two cliff facets slightly offset from each other and separated by sloping vegetated ledge. Um, and at the base of each of these cliffs there's a slightly overhung grey shaley unit which actually has some thin coal near the base of it um, and then above that uh, particularly on the left um, cliff face there's a thin bedded sandstone um, and what you can see more clearly on the right hand cliff face near the top is that those sandstones quickly get uh, um, much more much thicker bedded and more massive uh, and these uh, both show the repetition of a similar kind of sequence of rocks starting from shells and coals and siltstones at the bottom and passing up into increasingly thicker sandstones. So we have a repetitive or cyclic sedimentation typical of the Midland Valley and other parts of the Carboniferous in the, in, in the British Isles uh, of this time. And uh, these are actually typical of um, delta systems in which uh, we start off with um, uh, quiet water, maybe shallow marine and then fresh water, um, and then the increasing influence of a um, sandy system, a river channel system migrating into the area and depositing sandstone on the top of it as, um, as sandbars. This panorama is um, of the locality where the trace fossils were found on top of the flat um, ledge below the, um, the bank there and just above river level and uh, it's possible to log a section just by putting together observations from here um, the, up to the path above and, and some exposures further along the river when the water's low. Um, and you can see uh, if you uh, click that uh, the log will come up um, along with a legend at the bottom left. 
So you can see that uh, the log shows a dark shale at the base that becomes increasingly silty with little sandy beds. Um, and then quite quickly we get this thicker sand unit which is trough cross bedded uh, and rippled on the top. Um, and it has a whole um, set of different types of trace fossils in it. Um, uh, and you can see them explained in the legend there and in a box on the log. So um, we have the trackway itself. Um, we have a, a type of trace fossil um, called Beaconites. Um, and, uh, and then we have some U-shaped burrows called Arinicolites. Um, some sort of tubular ones which we'll see later on uh, that look like planolites although they may not be um, but uh, so that they may be horizontal burrows or they may be something different um, and uh, we can see uh, that in amongst all of those um, we have our trackway which is uh, given the <coughs> the um, ichnological or uh, trace fossil name of Diplignites cuitensis. Um, above that, the, the sediments get abruptly more muddy and pass up into a coaly, shaley unit, which has actually been worked a little bit for coal probably a long time ago. And then there's a gap where we go back up into uh, a, a, a more massive blocky sandstone again. So this is the context in which the, um, the trace fossil of Diplignites was discovered. Here's a view of that slab with the trace fossils on the surface of it. Um, and this is taken from the bank above looking down onto it and towards the river. So this is facing the opposite direction from the previous view that was looking across the river to this place. Um, and uh, in the first image here, uh, you can see the, um, the, the, there are two trackways, one complete going all the way from the grass to the water, um, and the other one going from the grass at the bottom of the image about halfway along before it becomes a lot more vague. Um, and it looks like a couple of um, tank tracks or caterpillar track impressions. Um, uh, and uh, you can also see that there are some kind of angular ribs uh, occasionally sticking out of the surface. They're quite small. Um, we'll come back to those, but they're the things that, that were, that, uh, were thought looked a little bit like planolites fossils, um, but horizontal tube-like structures just slightly sticking out of the surface. Uh, if you if you click now, you'll get a second image come up in the middle of the screen, which is a close-up uh, of the trackway. It's actually a close-up of the right-hand trackway uh, about halfway along. Um, and you can see the impressions in the, uh, going up through the middle of the image from bottom to top. And it consists of a series of roughly oval impressions in the surface of the sand uh, with ribs of sand um, or sediment in between them um, and each one of the oval impressions has a kind of ridge that cuts it in two so it ends up looking like a double depression uh, with, a, with a ridge going across the middle in between them um, and the, the general um, idea that you get here is that it looks like something's been pressed into uh, wet sediment and the sediment's kind of squidged up um, around where the force has been applied downwards um, and by the uh, by the actual by the foot of the animal that made it or the feet of the animal that made it um, if you click again and get the right hand, hand image to appear um, you can see these rather angular looking ribs sticking out of the um, out of the sandstone surface and this is um, slightly to the right of the right hand trackway um, and the impression I get is that they look rather like branching rootlets possibly of of trees um, the trouble is that they don't seem to have carbonaceous um, films around the outside of them which is what you'd expect for these things a sort of coaly film on them um, so perhaps that's not been preserved very well um, but that, that makes it slightly uncertain certain what these things are. They could be horizontal burrows or they could be the impressions of 
uh, roots on the surface or they could be fractures in the sandstone where it's dried out and cracked and then filled with other sand um, so unless you get a good three-dimensional impression of it it's hard to tell which is which um, but anyway uh, there, there are two clear trackways here and we get some other trace fossils which give an idea of the kind of wider environment in which these tracks were made on the surface of this uh, what was originally wet sand unit now it's not that easy uh, to get decent photographs at this particular site. The lighting's not very good and it's often interfered with by light and shade dappling the surface uh, through the trees above it. Um, so uh, what I did with uh, my co-author Jim Buckman was to take uh, a load of photographs of the surface uh, in an array a bit like um, uh, aerial photography where you have photographs overlapping each other by about two thirds um, and they were just taken about a, a meter or less above the surface there and this gave us an array of photographs that we could make a 3D model of um, in a very similar way to which uh, a landscape can be modeled or contoured using aerial overlapping aerial photographs and this is um, a method called photogrammetry so there's uh, some quite sophisticated software uh, that you can buy or, or this one was done with some free software that's available online um, and you basically um, drop your uh, digital photographs into the software um, and it will make a lot of calculations where it tries to match up similar looking points on the photo um, and generates a three-dimensional surface and uh, although you can't see it very clearly from here uh, this grey looking image here um, it's, just, it's just an image with the uh, all the colour stripped off it so that it's all just grey um, and you can manipulate the image and light it from different directions to bring out uh, light and shade and perspective but I think you can see particularly here the, uh, the left hand side of it um, near the left hand side you can see the trackway and this is as if viewed from the river now so the more continuous trackways on the left now and you can just about see part of the right hand one there and it's lit so that you can get a better idea uh, of what these sort of double oval impressions are uh, that each print is made from you can see the rootlets but you also get an idea particularly on the right hand side uh, it's quite subtle that the surface is actually rippled and in fact these ripples are asymmetrical indicating that they were made on the surface of a sand bed by, f by um, flowing water um, so uh, this, this is a way in which we can uh, capture an image and look at it and manipulate it in quite some detail but what is it that made these impressions well um, if you click now you can bring up um, some photographs from a paper by Ian Rolfe and Keith Ingham back in the late 1960s in the Scottish Journal of Geology um, and the upper image is a photograph um, of an actual body fossil of um, a myriapod of Carboniferous age uh, called Arthropleura and that's the genus name um, and you can see that it's a, a segmented limb um, with the, the, the foot end of it if you like on the left hand side and on the right hand side is where it's articulated to the body and they've reconstructed the kind of three-dimensional drawing of it uh, where you can see the, uh, the leg um, and uh, uh, you can also see this, this big powerful looking ridged plate um, which is uh, uh, where the leg is attached to the body and all the musculature is fixed and that has to be very strong because this creature um, was probably over, over two meters long um, and uh, lived on land so it wasn't supported by the buoyancy, buoyancy in water um, and therefore there were some quite powerful forces operating where the leg is connected to the body so that has to be very strong 
Um, now you can see here that uh, there's just one limb. Uh, this, this is called a uniramus limb. Um, some people have speculated uh, that Arthropleura had double limbs, rather like a trilobite. Um, but uh, in fact, it just seems to have one. So we don't really have an explanation of why the footprints are, or why the, why the trace fossil has double prints with two impressions on them and a ridge in the middle. But that may be because, uh, of course, there were lots of closely spaced legs, and this may be the way in which the legs uh, worked with each other to create motion. So where else are these um, trace fossils found in Scotland? Well, we've got some examples here. Um, and um, to put them in a time context, on the left-hand side is a chronostratigraphic column showing the different um, chronological units within the Carboniferous. So you might be familiar with the typical breakdown of the Carboniferous into the Tournasian, Visayan, Namurian, and Westphalian. Uh, the Namurian being the equivalent of the famous um, millstone grit in the Pennines, famous for its great rock climbs, um, and uh, and then we have a, a breakdown into smaller stages there, um, and then we've got the on in colour on the column the lithostratigraphic um, groups there, and we're in Lynn Park in the in the Clackmannan group. So uh, here are some other examples then, um, and just concentrate on the black symbols, not the colour ones here and the square one is the well-known one at Lagan on the north coast of Arran near the Cock of Arran um, and here we have a, a, a steeply dipping sandstone bed with two clear trackways there um, going kind of up from the bottom and then diagonally out across to the uh, to the right a little bit towards the top right corner of the image there. So like the one in Lynn Park, these are in the limestone coal formation um, but we have some older ones in the Visayan um, so the, the circular symbol here uh, in the lower part of the Aspian uh, corresponds to some examples in Fife at King Kelbrays near St Andrews and Crail and they're shown in the photograph at the bottom there and we can see two parallel trackways from one next to the other one and whether they were uh, walking along side by side or one just after the other or there was some time interval probably not a very long one um, between them um, uh, moving along there um, I'm not, not sure uh, we'll have a, a look at another example from there, there where we can show that they were forming uh, and they were moving along at the same time um, with each other um, but we'll see that in a minute um, and then we have some other examples on the south coast of Fife near the Boar's Hill, King Barnes and down in the Anstruther way, uh, direction and these are in the, the Anstruther formation of the Strathclyde group um, the coloured stars correspond to other types of features associated with them including the Beaconites trace fossils which um, some people think were actually created by uh, action of either small versions uh, or younger versions of the same animal Arthropleura or um, some action of some of its other organs um, uh, so um, here are, these are examples and they're actually widely known across the Pennines in um, uh, in England as well uh, and uh, in, in far-flung places around the world including the USA in the Carboniferous What did Arthropleura look like then? What was the beast that made these prints? So here's a, a reconstruction on the left-hand side of the screen here. Um, <clears throat> it's a myriapod. It's a, a segmented arthropod uh, with um, probably 23 pairs of legs. Um, and uh, if you don't look at it too hard, you can see uh, that it looks like a kind of familiar um, domestic arthropod, uh, like a slater, for example. But then look at the scale down at the bottom next to it, and there's a there's a there's a chap there for scale, uh, and you can see that in fact these things are uh, up to two meters long, which sort of fits the 
the width or the space between the sets of tracks on our example in Lynn Park and the ones I've just shown you from Fife. Um, and uh, if, 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 you, if you click and you're not too alarmed by the image that comes up, uh, there's a reconstruction of one of them in action, so to speak. Um, I think this one comes from a rather f fanciful uh, reconstruction in an old BBC TV series. Um, and actually it is thought that uh, these Arthur Pleura could rear up uh, the front half could actually uh, climb up high and maybe that helps it get over obstacles or deal with um, predators or, or even prey, something like that which raises the question of uh, what did it eat um, and some early researchers thought that they were carnivorous but uh, we'll have a look at that again in a little while so um, this is the this is the suspect for the f formation of these footprints. Dress fossils are pieces of evidence that show us aspects of the behaviour of animals uh, or plants, in fact, um, and they can tell us about their motion. Um, perhaps their feeding uh, habits um, and also perhaps just ways in which they can make a home for themselves and uh, here we have a nice example from Pitt and Weem in Fife or near Pitt and Weem you can just about see St Andrews across the bay in the background there on the horizon um, and there's a long slab of sandstone here she was which has been tilted up quite steeply so that you get a nice sort of top-down view of a trackway that goes right the way along the length of it. Um, and this comes from a, an account, a paper that was written in the Scottish Journal of Geology by Martin White in 2018. Um, and uh, his interpretation of it uh, uh, arises from the in interaction, in fact, of three trackways here and the drawing um, below the photograph shows one of them in green the, the more continuous one um, another one in yellow which actually crosses over the first one and then disappears off down into the ground uh, and then another one uh, which is separate from the other two and they don't touch over at the right hand end in blue on the diagram um, uh, it's possible to determine from the form of the, uh, the prints there that they were moved moving from um, right to left across the image here, across the, uh, the sandstone bedding surface there. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, Martin White's interpretation of this was that the, uh, the one um, that was making the trackway coloured in green uh, was encountered by another one that came um, and actually uh, that uh, for a period of time you only see three sets of tracks and not four um, and it therefore appears that one of them had partly climbed on top of the other one um, and so you've got two trackways from one and only one trackway from the one that was on that was partially on top um, and, and uh, he interpreted this as reproductive uh, activity or basically arthropod sex um, and if you click and you're not of too sensitive a frame of mind uh, then you'll see Martin's re drawn reconstruction of what was happening at the point where the encounter happened and then after that uh, the one making the yellow track um, carried on uh, and disappeared off down the sandstone bed in, uh, uh, which is now going down underground there um, so this this is uh, an interpretation of a complex set of trackways um, showing perhaps uh, a form of reproductive behavior paper I talked about um, and another aspect of behavior of course is diet um, and that's actually the gut uh, of a specimen that's sitting in the British Geological Survey Museum I think or collections um, and if you look very closely at it you see for example things like this these are low void features and they appear to be lycopods so uh, at least the major part of the diet was vegetable and probably just decaying vegetable matter on the forest floor uh, rather than the fearsome looking carnivorous thing that it was thought to be beforehand. Uh, next one, please. Uh, what was the environment like where they were living? Well, uh, we have coals, we have muds, uh, 
uh, we have uh, highly bioturbated and, and, and burrowed uh, sands that also had thing, lots of things sort of skittering about on the surface there. Um, and uh, from this and other information from all over the Carboniferous uh, that was in the sort of equatorial region at that time, uh, it's probably something like this. This is the Mississippi Delta uh, here, um, a bird's foot delta, probably a rather unusual style of delta worldwide. doesn't look much like a delta. Um, but we have all those sorts of environments with the, the, the major distributary channels here and then splays going off. Uh, branching in all directions with lagoons and pools in between them that would be would, ha would have sand injected into them whenever the whenever the uh, levees broke the banks broke and a flood moved sediment into the pools in between and the pools were probably vegetated um, and probably quite large sources of food for a big creature like this that needed a lot of food and incidentally I presume it needed an awful lot of oxygen you know, an arthropod that big is going to be quite oxygen hungry. It's not as good as circulating oxygen around its body as we are. Um, Neil will correct me if I'm burbling on here and talking rubbish, but uh, I think it is thought that oxygen levels in the atmosphere were higher at that time uh, than now, to the extent that they wouldn't be destroyed by fire. Um, and uh, I think that's it. So that's the beast of Lynn Park. 